long-awaited Mueller report. The investigation did not establish that members of the Trump campaign conspired or coordinated with the Russian government. President Trump and his supporters say Democrats, they've gone too far with claims of wrongdoing after Robert Mueller found the president. Has the media's reputation been helped or hurt? Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we're covering this week. The aftermath of the Mueller report, the stain it leaves on the reporting of news outlets who went all in on the story of the Trump campaign and Russian collusion. Julian Assange and the Ecuadorian government at odds at the London Embassy once again. Ethiopia, one year after the arrival of a new government. What has it meant for the media there? And take a deep breath. Yoga as collective therapy for a United Kingdom divided by Brexit. Before moving up into our rising nationalism. Russiagate, the theory that Donald Trump colluded with Vladimir Putin to hijack the 2016 U.S. presidential elections was a story that was too big to fail. But that's what happened, and certain American news outlets now have some questions to answer. The official summary of the Mueller report about alleged collusion says there's no clear evidence of it. Trump's people had many questionable contacts with influential Russian nationals, but not directly with the government. Having sold Americans the seductive and conspiratorial notion that the man in the Oval Office might be a compromised foreign agent, now comes a moment of reckoning for the U.S. media. That includes the networks, who gave short shrift to skeptics who challenged the prevailing collusion narrative, the one that boosted ratings and brought on the clicks, a golden goose of a story. For those skeptics, it's vindication time. As for Trump himself, after two years of accusing the media of a witch hunt, calling them the enemy of the people, this story has handed him a 2020 election gift like no other. Our starting point this week is Washington. The Mueller Report. When it came out that the Mueller Report had found there was no Trump-Russia collusion... The special counsel did not find that the Trump campaign understandable shock throughout the political media establishment. We are going to hopefully get a printout. It feels like the seeds of a cover-up are here. The uh, case for a Trump-Russia conspiracy was just not there. I mean, when you do journalism, you don't follow what your imagination wants you to believe. This is international warfare against our country. We follow what the facts are, and the facts undermine this notion of a Trump-Russia conspiracy. Five voices on the Mueller report. Three who were skeptical of the Russia collusion narrative all along, and two who argue the journalists were right to focus on the story. And no network anchor invested more airtime, more of her own credibility on the case for collusion than MSNBC's Rachel Maddow. Because if the worst is true, if the, the presidency is effectively a Russian op. If you had to pick one person uh, who promoted the hysteria, then uh, she would be that person. Her ratings were going down until Trump was elected and until Russiagate became a possibility. And she seized on it immediately, well before Trump's inauguration. We're about to find out if the new president of our country is going to do what Russia wants. With this story, she started playing a character where she sort of became this patriotic uh, sort of front actor. There have been tons of Russians! There was a very powerful element of fear that ran through her shows. I mean, the, the, the most infamous broadcast was the one during a cold front earlier this year. Russia can just shut off the electricity. They have that ability now. Where she suggested that the Russians had the capability to turn off the heat across the United States at any moment. What would happen if Russia killed the power in Fargo today? You know, that would be an act of war. There was this implied subtext that the Russians were this sort of reasonless evil that uh, was everywhere, and we had to have vigilance and watch out for it. Everyone is going to accuse others of doing poor reporting. I would point to Margaret Sullivan's piece in The Washington Post where she said, the solid reporting done by a lot of people should be celebrated because it's a hard story to tell. And then there's cable TV and we need to make a distinction between those. Now, commentary television is not news, it's commentary. Given all that's happened since then. And Rachel Maddow in particular, she has certainly pushed the Mueller matter, but she's done so in a way that was supported by the facts we knew at the time. So I'm not 
prepared to go with any of the folks who say this was uh, hysterical, this was wrong, uh, certainly was driven by the commercial interests of television in terms of what they covered. That angle, commercial considerations, tends to get overlooked. The focus is usually on ideology, since Maddow's network, MSNBC, leans to the left politically. However, since marketing itself is America's anti-Trump news channel, MSNBC has seen record ratings. At times, Maddow has drawn more viewers in her 9 p.m. slot than her competition at Fox News. Just a few years ago, that would have been unheard of. The publication of the Mueller report had an instant effect on Maddow's numbers. Ratings for her first two shows after the report's release were down by more than 20%. As telling as The Voice's NBC puts on the air to discuss Russiagate is who it does not. Journalists like Matt Taibbi and Aaron Maté, who have never bought into the collusion narrative. The case of MSNBC is certainly a case of a network prioritizing uh, profit and partisanship over actual journalism. A partisanship in the sense that this narrative of Trump-Russia, it was the preferred one of Democratic Party elites that MSNBC is aligned with and profit in the sense that this story helped drive MSNBC upwards in the ratings. But now they have to think about what this has done to their credibility. We were all ostracized. None of us were invited on television. Other reporters and other people in the media, they saw that, they weren't blind. and sent a message to everybody else that if you stick your head up, you know, you're gonna get the same treatment. What is Donald Trump trying to hide? MSNBC was not alone in investing in the Russiagate story. The Russians and collusion. Something that looks and smells a whole lot like collusion. CNN, other networks, and some of America's more prestigious papers, the New York Times and Washington Post included, also found it hard to resist. And they reverted to some bad journalistic habits Americans saw in the aftermath of 9-11. According to U.S. intelligence, senior... When intelligence sources fed them the Bush administration's fictional stories of Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. We're looking at the same kinds of problems that we saw in the run-up to the Iraq war. Uh, the failure to track down sources, uh, to check for actual evidence and for corroborative evidence, and a, and a real abandonment of professional standards. The embrace ultimately, uh, in both cases, of a kind of stenographer's role, uh, rather than establishing an independent perspective. Some of the same intelligence officials who were involved in the initial Trump-Russia investigation, and who also were involved in the Iraqi WMD scam, were put on cable news as experts. Former CIA Director John Brennan, he is our senior national security and intelligence analyst for MSNBC. John Brennan, head of the CIA, and James Clapper, the director of national intelligence. And for two years, they took part in promoting the notion that Trump was possibly compromised by Russia. John Brennan also predicted that Mueller was going to hand down indictments for the Trump-Russia conspiracy. And he is going to be delivering what I think are going to be his indictments. That never came. And the lesson we should draw from that, which we should have drawn after Iraq, is that we do not trust intelligence officials or anyone without concrete evidence. What we got today is a summary of Robert Mueller's findings. Now, after years of being told to expect an indictment, even a possible impeachment, American news audiences have to reassess the entire Russiagate story, and they lack the evidence they need to do that. The Mueller investigation, a reported 300 pages long, has not been made public. All the media have to go on is a four-page summary from the Attorney General, Bill Barr, who was appointed by the President. That's a key argument anti-Trump voices in the media are holding on to. We don't know what's in the Mueller report. That is the most important fact to keep in mind. We only know what Attorney General Barr, in a very brief letter, says about the Mueller report. Russian interference is and was real. People around this president did things they should not have done. They knew it because they lied about it. So uh, those people who are claiming this is wild hysteria, nonsense. There is lots of smoke here. There are uh, financial transactions with oligarchs. The way the world works under Vladimir Putin, the oligarchs are just as important than the Russian government. The Barr memo says that Donald Trump was helped to win by a hostile foreign government. 
and he cheered it every step of the way. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. If it's not fair to criticize him for having done that, whatever his criminal liability for doing so, then I think we're in a bad place for democracy. Is that why he won? No, not by itself. But does Donald Trump deserve some criticism for cheering on a hostile foreign government? Yeah, he does. It's going to be only America first. And it's not as if there's been a shortage of domestic Trump-related scandal stories for reporters to chase. The multiple indictments of his campaign and administration officials, his former lawyer, the payoffs to Trump's former lovers, his courtship of neo-Nazis. However, those stories lack the foreign bogeyman angle. The idea that the Kremlin had somehow helped decide the 2016 U.S. election. It's as though the American media, along with the opposition Democratic Party, must look overseas for someone to blame for putting Donald Trump in the White House, when they should be looking closer to home, much closer. Part of the reason we have Russiagate is because we have a political and media culture that is dominated by people who do not want to take responsibility for their own failures, their own actions. The media gave Trump endless attention, billions of dollars worth of free advertising during his election campaign. And he was capitalizing on the very real anger towards the policies of Democratic Party elites. Their neoliberal economic policies brought misery to large parts of the country. Instead of reckoning with their own failures in 2016, Democrats turned to a scapegoat, which was Russia. It qualifies as collusion. The product of collusion. And collusion. And unfortunately, our media enabled them every step of the way. We're discussing other media stories that are on our radar this week with one of our producers, Minakshi Ravi. Mina, Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, has been in that Ecuadorian embassy in London for seven years now. Over the past year, the conditions of his asylum there have been tightened considerably, and you've got the latest. As you said, Richard, we've seen a progressive squeeze on Julian Assange. And this latest story we're hearing gives us a sense of just how tense things have become at the embassy. On March 25th, Cassandra Fairbanks, a reporter with an American right-wing online outlet called The Gateway Pundit, went to meet with Assange. She says that her meeting had been pre-approved by the Ecuadorian embassy, but when she got there, the situation became hostile. Fairbanks says she was locked in a room with cameras and surveillance equipment, and she overheard an argument between Assange, his lawyer, and embassy staff, including the ambassador. She reports Assange was told he could not enter the room unless he submitted to a body scan. Now, the suspicion was that he was taking in a radio device with him to interfere with any surveillance recordings. The argument was loud, heated and prolonged. And eventually, a two-hour-long meeting was just eight minutes. We've got to consider the source here, though, don't we? I mean, Gateway Pundit is a hard-right news outlet right alongside outfits like Breitbart. Of course. And that alone mandates some skepticism of their reporting just like we're skeptical of some of the reporting by the UK's Guardian. Now, of course, that newspaper has a much wider and more mainstream audience, but some of their reporting on WikiLeaks and Assange has ranged from inaccurate to just outright malicious. What's changed in the relationship between Assange and the Ecuadorian government? That government granted him asylum back in 2012 when Assange said he feared being extradited to the US. Is this just the result of the arrival of a new government in Quito? Well, that's a significant factor, certainly. Now, in 2012, the president of Ecuador was Rafael Correa, leftist, deeply critical of the United States. In 2017, he was succeeded by Lenin Moreno, who describes himself as a centrist and has publicly called Julian Assange his inherited problem. Now, what seems to have triggered the crackdown on Assange's internet connection and the frequency of his visitors are comments he made last year on social media about Ecuador's allies, including Spain. It is an explicit condition of Assange's asylum that he won't make any comment on Ecuador's foreign policy. And in addition to all of this, we also have reports that the U.S. State Department is putting pressure on the Ecuadorian government to lift the asylum, to lift its protection of Julian Assange. Okay, thanks, Mina. It's now been one year since East Africa's most populous country, Ethiopia, experienced a political transformation, a change in leadership after years of social unrest and demonstrations. Prime Minister Haile Mariam Desalegnyi unexpectedly quit, leading to the appointment of Abiy Ahmed, a representative of the country's largest ethnic group, the Oromos. 
The reforms came swiftly. Abiy packed his cabinet with a record number of women. He promised to address the social tensions among Ethiopia's multiple ethnic groups, and he forged an historic agreement to end the 20-year standoff with neighboring Eritrea. Changes came quickly to the media realm as well. Dozens of new news websites have appeared. More than 20 new media publications are now in business. And numerous journalists, jailed and stifled under Desalegni and his predecessor, have been freed. Last year, we spoke with four journalists of different media backgrounds about the role that social media has played in the political transition. Now, about nine months later, we've gone back to those voices to see how the new space is developing. The Listening Post's Flo Phillips now on the Ethiopian media one year into the Abiy era. April the 2nd, 2018. Ethiopia's new Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, is ushered into power on the coattails of national protests. One year on, the bold agenda of Africa's youngest leader has attracted praise from around the world. Well, Ethiopia's Prime Minister has only been in the job since April, um, but he's taken the country through a number of I've reforms. I've spoken to young and old, and all of them are really, really excited about what the future holds for their country. Taking groups off the terror list, release political prisoners and journalists. Behind the headlines, however, a much more complex, tense transition is taking place. We are dealing with a country that is in its own twilight zone. The transition is, in many ways, very fragile. This is Sadale Lemma, the editor-in-chief of Addis Standard, a prominent newspaper that led coverage of the series of protests that have taken place in the country. It's a very delicate, sensitive, um, highly emotional kind of contestation awaiting this country. Tamrak Georgis is managing editor of the Addis Fortune newspaper, a media mainstay that reported throughout the 2018 revolution and transition. The politics and the policy possibilities are complicated. And, and the picture is far more complicated than, than it was a year ago. Journalist and blogger Eskinder Neger. After years in prison, he was released on a presidential pardon. He set up shop again and rekindled his career. There is still doubt whether the country could make it to democracy, whether it will uh, fall back to dictatorship, or whether it's actually get worse in, in going to war. And Jawa Mohammed, the influential and controversial head of the Aromia Media Network, he returned from exile to a hero's welcome. Four journalists, all with a part to play in this new phase of their country's history. This is not the first time they're speaking with the Listening Post. In 2018, we interviewed them on their media expectations of the new Prime Minister. We've come back to them now to get their thoughts on key media aspects of Abiy Ahmed's Ethiopia. If he's ready to be held accountable, he has to start talking to uh, the media. They are not hostile to the media, but they have not been accessible. They have not been as open as they promised to be. They set up this new uh, Prime Minister press office uh, with a hope and promise that they'll hold this weekly or bi-weekly press conferences. They uh, had just once, and I think, and they did not do it after that. He has also not met the media so far to face our questions. So that makes me worry of whether he is genuine or not. If you wanted to have um, in a request for an interview, you don't get that opportunity. We see more and more government officials using the social media, which makes them directly accessible to people. However, I'm very disappointed that the distribution of this information is highly choreographed. So it's very frustrating that we're limited into uh, the kind of information government authorities want us to hear. Social media is, you know, that's where the game is. That's where it's going to be, even in the future. It will be the medium through which they uh, will engage in political discourse, and it will be the medium through which we'll mobilize. I can't imagine the world without social media at this point. It's great to live in a world in which, you know, millions of people are able to, to talk to each other. The kind of fast change that we've seen over the last three years without the social media would have been 
impossible. The value of social media has been um, realized to the extent that um, you, can, you can find every color, shade uh, of views in the social media. But the message that is churned out is substance of high polarization, which is part and parcel of the political process that, that is taking place. You know, there are mobs on, in, on every side. They have demands, political uh, interests. They are trying to assert that. I think uh, moving forward, particularly media like uh, the one I run and myself, we are going to move from uh, one ethnic line advocacy more into inclusiveness because we have a responsibility to do that. It's quite difficult to be as aggressive, as vocal uh, as I used to be. Today, we are not dealing with a full-blown authoritarian government. Today, we are dealing with kind of leadership that has aligned itself with the protesters, that has aligned itself with the population. So, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, I'm an activist that has moved from open and aggressive criticism of the government to a more critical support of uh, the government. So my role is an activist, but with a lot more responsibility. Democracy has not been realized in this country. We're still fighting for democracy, so, so we need the activism. When this transition is over, and if there's no democracy, we will not be able to practice journalism, we'll be back to square one. So until we have democracy, it's our obligation to fight, you know, to be active in promoting democracy. Some would say we have to remain activists until democracy dawned on us. And uh, I don't have any problem with somebody's stand and saying, I will have to continue like that. But it becomes problematic when stories are being corrupted by online activism, including journalists who are doubling as activists. And, and it's very unfortunate that we are in that, in that circumstance. And I do hope that we would come to our senses. When you are a professional journalist, there are things that you need to observe. And more than anything else, you have to observe your own code of conduct, which requires you to be factual, accurate, fair, balanced, objective, reasonable, all these are things that you need to observe that are completely alien to the world of activism. Ethiopia's political transition is balanced on the edge of hope and fear. Hope for a political transformation and fear of slipping back into repression. For the first time in 13 years, there are no journalists in the country's jails. Hundreds of websites have been unblocked and licenses have been granted to 23 new media publications. But there's still a long way to go. Ethiopian media have years of control and censorship to break free from, and outlets there are still working on forming professional bonds to strengthen their industry. Media houses need to come together, discuss what should be, how can we help the transition uh, without compromising our uh, journalistic uh, principles. If we do that, we can help. But uh, expecting the media to not take side, not to advance certain interests is just uh, not realistic. Uh, once you have a democratic framework, if you have a democratic system, if you are a democratic country, by the way, then a na natural outcome of that, of that system would be a press law, a good laws that ensure freedom of expression, that ensures that, that, you know, that, that journalists are prote protected. I do hope we would have a press council, most importantly, where we come together and, and, and hammer out on our own code of conduct. We will uh, have to restrain ourselves into professionalism. <laughs> Other than picking a topic and pitting one community with another. Uh, that is not the job for, for journalists. The media has continued to be an instrument of uh, power. Uh, the instrumentalization of the media uh, continues. Where so many things are on the balance, what do people want from the media? They want the media to be a force of verification, a force, a place, a platform for rational discourse. And finally, back in 2016, when Britain voted to leave the European Union, the question on the referendum ballot seemed simple enough. Do you want out of the EU or not? But the longer this Brexit story goes on, the harder it is to understand. The negotiations and the issues, freedom of movement, customs unions, the Irish backstop were complex enough. And that was before MPs got involved with their parliamentary procedures, their votes, amendments. Britain is in a state of confusion. 
which is where Sammy J comes in. He's an Australian comedian who suggests the best way to deal with Brexit and to explain it is through something he calls Brexit yoga. Now, that may be a bit of a stretch. But this video, first seen on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's comedy channel, has millions of views online. We'll leave you now with an excerpt, and we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Brexit yoga. OK, let's warm up first by uniting our kingdom. And when you're ready to face the world, we're going to move up into our European Union. Arms nice and high. Feel those tariffs falling away. Enjoy your freedom of movement. Summer's in the south of France. And holding this position for several decades before moving up into our rising nationalism. Also known as, I don't like paying Greek debt. And from here, we'll head slowly down into our referendum. Remember to breathe. Now, some of you might want to remain in this position. Some of you might want to leave. Just listen to your body and feel it being pulled ever so slightly to the right, and leave it is. This, of course, leads us straight into our instant regret. So just feel your trading power diminish as the price of camembert increases. 